from Micro TV. This is Infectious Disease Puscast, episode 54, recorded on May 8th, 2024. Hello, everyone. I'm Daniel Griffin, and joining me today is Sarah Dong. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. Welcome to another Puscast. References, as always, are available in our show notes at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. I don't know if folks can see, but Daniel looks very spiffy today. <laughs> you should, yes, you I, should I, tell I, everyone what you're wearing. Well, they can, they can, the YouTube, right? They can go on YouTube. They can see I'm <laughs> wearing um, my my anthrax bow tie. There are matching socks, mm-hmm. um, and I have one of my nice springtime gray suits. I mean, I've pulled the suits back out again. We'll see how long that lasts, but wearing that instead of the white coat. So (laughs) I think apparently, though, if you wear a white coat, everything you say is about 10% more believable. So Mm. this may be like one of those ones where like, yeah, just not sure what he's saying. He's not wearing a white coat. He's making stuff up. He's wearing a suit. (laughs) Well, we're hot off the heels of the Met Gala. So, you know, basically this is just as good as that, right? (laughs) You, you know, actually, I, I usually don't pay any attention at all to the Met Gala, um, yeah. but Zendaya had some really impressive, She's you know, and there were multiple outfits. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm a bit of a fan, so yes. <laughs> yes, I totally agree. Well, <laughs> before I get us too off track, um, Buzzcast is a review of the ID literature for the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. So on to the literature, shall we? Certainly. Let us start with viral and remember to listen to TWIV. The article Maternal and Dengue and Health Outcomes of Children was recently published in the American Economic Journal Applied Economics. Not sure how many of our ID crowd reads this journal, but I suspect very few. Here, the two authors studied the effect of maternal dengue infections on birth outcomes using linked administration records from Brazil. Um, In this study, they reported negative effect of dengue infections on birth weight. They also reported large increases in children's hospitalization and medical expenditures up to three years after birth. I I must say I was surprised by that finding. Um, But beyond this, there are some interesting figures where you really see the seasonality of dengue in Brazil. Cool. Um, I pulled a couple things for our viral section. The first one is a correspondence from the New England Journal of Medicine entitled Highly Pathogenic Avian Influenza A H5N1 Virus Infection in a Dairy Farm Worker. Um, So recently, the H5N1 clade 2344B viruses um, were identified in dairy cows and unpasteurized milk um, in a couple U.S. states. And so this is a case from a dairy farm worker in Texas from late March. Um, They actually have a picture of the right eye redness and discomfort that had developed in this patient along with a subconjunctival hemorrhage and some serous drainage. The patient had uh, direct and sort of close exposure to dairy cows. It sounds like both healthy and sick. Um, The patient wore gloves but not respiratory or eye protection um, and it was diagnosed by a positive PCR test from both conjunctival and nasopharyngeal swabs. So the patient was isolated and received five days of oral oseltamivir. So quick read, just pointing it out. Um, I feel like that picture has popped up on <laughs> like when you're uh, looking on X or something. I feel like I've seen the eye picture pop up. Yeah, All right. it's, and- inter- it's interesting. Apparently, I learned this from Vincent, or maybe he reminded me of saying one. So apparently we have the right receptors. There's different sialic acid receptors. There's uh-huh. like the... Two six and the three six, I, I'm, or two three and something, um, but anyway, <laughs> we have those receptors in our eyes and apparently in the very lower airways, but we don't necessarily have the right um, highly pathogenic avian influenza receptors in our mm-hmm. upper sort of airways, trachea, upper bronchi. So that's why you see it in the eyeballs like that, which fascinating. Oh, that is so interesting. Yeah. Um. All right. And then my next two were both from CID. The first one I'll point out is the impact of pre-transplant respiratory virus detection on post-transplant outcomes in children undergoing hematopoietic cell transplantation. 
This was a retrospective cohort study of myeloablative allogeneic HCT recipients who were screened for respiratory viruses at least once within 90 days prior to their transplant. They found that 134, 134 of 310 patients had a positive respiratory virus test. The authors found fewer days alive and out of the hospital, the acronym DAOH, uh, in patients with uh, so sort of transplant factors, so younger age, total body irradiation, umbilical cord transplant, an absolute lymphocyte count less than 100, and HCT comorbidity index of three or greater. There were viral factors that were associated with um, fewer days alive and out of the hospital, including symptomatic infection, rhinovirus, uh, and symptoms, a symptomatic pre-transplant of a respiratory infection. Uh, but when they did do the multivariable analysis, the viral factors did not remain significant. So correcting for those um, other components, really, the transplant. So there was a higher incidence of progression to post-transplant lower respiratory tract infection with the same pre-transplant virus um, as the last positive PCR before the transplant within 30 days. Uh, so I, this gives some pediatric perspective. There's a couple prior studies that have mostly looked at adults. Um, all of this has to be interpreted in the setting that the current guidelines recommend delaying a stem cell transplant in the presence of certain viruses, so adeno, flu, human metanumo, paraflu, RSV, generally for sure, but things like rhinovirus or other coronaviruses, it's less clear. Um, so this institution does delay transplant for those um, respiratory viruses. So in overall, there's a pretty limited number of patients uh, with these pre-transplant lower respiratory tract infections in the cohort, but I think pulling out the rhinovirus piece that kind of raises the question whether a pre-transplant rhinovirus should also prompt a delay. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll learn more. Um, and then this next one, also from CID, that uh, I'll give a short description, but Bictegravir use during pregnancy, a multicenter retrospective analysis evaluating HIV viral suppression and perinatal outcomes. Uh, this is a real-world use of Bictegravir, uh, which was associated with high levels of viral suppression and similar perinatal outcomes, and really the largest cohort to date included 147 pregnant patients from four sites, so Grady in Atlanta, UPenn in Philly, Baylor in Houston, and University of Miami. So just awesome news. I think, you know, you would suspect that Big Tiger Vera would be fine, um, and here's some, some additional info. No, it's nice, because I think we all sort of embraced this it's medicine, so, so it's nice. to do the one pill, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they already so, have a lot of things to you do. You can right. use Big Tarvi. It's all good. Yeah. All right, bacterial, be sure to listen to uh, This Week in Microbiology. And maybe we should throw in a plug for febrile. There's a <laughs> recent uh, recent episode I really enjoyed all about what we dare to do after prosthetic uh, joint <laughs> concerns. Um, and uh, we will start this section with the article, Group A Streptococcus Pharyngitis in Children, New Perspectives on Rapid Diagnostic Testing and Antimicrobial Stewardship, recently published in Pediatric ID Consult. Um, I was actually going to have to talk about this. Have to. I shouldn't word it that way. Oh, my gosh. I was... The privilege the of speaking. To? The opportunity. Yes, it is. Yes, yes. <laughs> I've been offered the opportunity to speak to our local pediatric uh, uh, providers about this whole issue. But fortunately, the head of Peds ID at Winthrop is jumping in in my stead. So, they thank you. You know. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, th this is, I think, an important topic. And the authors start by reminding us that U.S. guidelines. Uh, from the Infectious Disease Society of America and American Academy of Pediatrics emphasize the importance of avoiding antibiotics without test confirmation of gas group A strep. Um, U.S. guidelines outline two testing methods for diagnosing um, uh, group A strep pharyngitis. The classic method to detect uh, group A strep is culture of the throat swab on a blood agar plate. Um, Culture is the traditional diagnostic reference standard, um, but culture has some issues, right? It's not optimal due to the 18 to 36 hour turnaround time for results. Um, now, the second method is those rapid 
tests, those RADTs. Uh, much faster than culture can be performed at the point of care uh, with results available after five to 10 minutes. Um, now, in addition to those rapid antigen detection tests, we have nucleic acid amplification tests, NATS, um, and these are diagnostic tests that have emerged uh, really in the last decade um, alongside the culture and those rapid antigen detection tests. Now, these NATs provide really fast results, typically in two to 30 minutes, have a high specificity, approximately 93 to 97%, um, and high sensitivity, 96 to 99%. Um, so because of their high sensitivity, the negative NAT results do not require a confirmatory test. So that whole do a rat if it's positive, you know, if your rapid strep is positive, then go ahead and do a culture to confirm. Um, the NATs, if it's positive, it's positive. Um, one of the things that they do, in addition to showing us some great figures, is they make this important comment um, that the, the rapid antigen tests and the NATs, the nucleic acid amplification tests, um, should not be used as tests for cure, right? So if you do want to do a test for cure and there's circumstances when that might be done, culture. You're doing a culture. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I am going to talk about masqueraders around disaster, clinical features of scrub typhus in Fukushima, Japan. Uh, so this is published in OFID. Scrub typhus is endemic in Fukushima and is the most common rickettsiosis disease in Japan, which I learned. Um, its clinical presentation can be atypical. This paper reviewed 55 of those cases that um, they had really to make that point and see what are the features you might see or um, the unusual things that pop up. Most of the cases were female patients, 64%. The mean age was 69. Uh, for diagnosis, 31 of the cases were positive for serology and PCR. 23 cases were only positive on serology, and there was one fatal case that was only diagnosed by PCR. Um, and so the authors mapped out the sites where the patients likely were bitten, uh, which showed some seasonal distribution um, with what they described as the spring-summer type and late-autumn types. Um, and then they characterized the clinical features. I, I'm not going to go through all of it, but I thought it was useful to pull out that the classic triad of fever, rash, and eschar were absent in about a third of the cases. Uh, about 11% of cases presented without an eschar at all. Um, and then they ultimately described what were some sort of unusual complication or atypical feature in 40% of those patients. Um, and the overall fatality rate was 1.8%. The other thing that I uh, learned about and thought was interesting is that they comment on the Great East Japan earthquake of 2011 and the subsequent accident at the nuclear power plant in this uh, Fukushima area. And Obviously, we can't draw clear relationships off of this study, but they do point to the decline in cases after this time period. Um, so I learned a lot about scrub typhus. Everyone on should read it and learn about it too. I have never uh, actually diagnosed this in a patient either. So I, uh, I once made a little girl cry diagnosing her scrub typhus. It was, well, it's nice to see here that about 90% had that classic escar, but her escar was like under her chin. So she's got her like chin tucked down on her chest. And that was the one part, you know, you're trying to do your thorough exam looking for a possible yeah. escar. And I had to lift the chin to see the S car. She started crying. I saw the S car. I had mixed feelings. One, like, okay, now I know what's going on. But two, I feel so bad. I made a little girl cry. <laughs> and that was uh, southern India. That was in Tamil Nadu, um, one of the endemic areas. So go spend some time in Tamil Nadu, Sarah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, another UTI paper with the article Performance of Urinalysis Parameters in Predicting Urinary Tract Infection. Does one size fit all? Published in CID. So these are the results of a multi hospital cohort study of 3,392 patients, and they report that positive urinalysis parameters had poor positive predictive value for diagnosing urinary tract infection. Um, combined urinalysis parameters, so pyuria or nitrite, uh, performed better 
than Pyuria alone for ruling out UTI. Um, they also report that performance of all your analysis parameters was poor in older women. Well, uh, a little tricky to sort this out is well, what is the actual definition of a UTI? Apparently, they define it as greater than 100,000 CFUs of bacteria in the urine and signs or symptoms of a UTI. So I mm. found this a little bit difficult to interpret in all honesty. Yeah. Um, and I think I'm wrapping up this section. Uh, I put it in bacteria because it seemed to fit the best, but in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation, ISHLT 2024 Infection def Definitions for Durable and Acute Mechanical Circulatory Support Devices, uh, I think, uh, you know, I see VAD infections a lot, so I knew that these were on their way out but hadn't seen it. Um, so this provides some updated definitions for infections um, for things like VADs, uh, which you can find outlined in Table 2. And they create some new definitions for acute mechanical circulatory support devices, so things like uh, balloon pumps and, and ECMO. And so I, uh, there's still sort of a breakdown of linking infections to uh, MCS, so mechanical circulatory support devices, MCS specific or non MCS specific. And uh, they changed the, uh, we typically would say sort of superficial versus deep when referring to percutaneous driveline infections. And now they recommend more of the language of complicated versus uncomplicated. Um, so I won't walk through all of it, but they have some nice figures um, just kind of pointing out the different sites of infections like percutaneous lead infection, vascular graft infections, and so on. Um, and then they have a very nice table, too, that really summarizes everything with their diagnostic criteria and what your typical sort of workup and investigation would be. Super helpful. All right, fungal. I'm still waiting for The Last of Us next season, just by the way. Um, I don't know if any of the actors or actresses from that show listen, but... <laughs> Pablo Pascal, if you're listening. If you do, you can <laughs> hey, Joe, call me. <laughs> give us a call. <laughs> we, we'd love the next season. <laughs> we'll make sure to give you a shout out and that'll give you that huge ID Puscas bump. But all right. Uh, in the fungal section, a nice review. Cryptococcal disease in diverse hosts was recently published in the England Journal of Medicine. And I really enjoyed the first sentence of the mycological features section. Are you ready? Cryptococcus is a basidio um, mycetaceous yeast that is unique among pathogens in humans in that it has an immune shielding polysaccharide capsule and a cell wall lacase with broad immunomodulatory properties, which together predisposes the organ to neurotropism. <sighs> Breath. Okay, so basidio mycetaceous meaning tending to annoy or cause ill will, overly aggressive, willing or ready to agree or consent, persistent, stubborn, or obstinate, or in this context, simply belonging to the domain eukaryota, kingdom fungi, subkingdom dicaria, and division basidiomycota. So producing sexually via the specialized club-shaped and cells called Basidia. I think we can handle the rest of those words, but great figure that I suspect will make it into lots of upcoming slide decks. And, and we may even have a case in the hospital right now, a, a gal with uh, very few T cells um, uh, living with a house in Vermont, HIV, um, and with a very high opening pressure um, above 50, actually. Ouch. All right. I am going to move us right into parasitic. That's it, guys. Work on that next season of The Last of Us. Parasitic, be sure to listen to This Week in Parasitism. Um, we have a couple articles here. The first one is the article, Evaluation of Less Invasive Sampling Tools for the Diagnosis of Cutaneous Leishmaniasis, published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. Um, I'm actually helping, uh, I think, a group that's trying to work on some of these point-of-care limited resource um, setting tests. But the background here is that while the diagnosis of cutaneous leishmaniasis is often still done using invasive samples, such as punch, punch biopsy specimens and skin slit smears, highly sensitive molecular techniques enable using more 
patient-friendly sampling devices. What can be more patient-friendly than taking a chunk out of the edge of a wound? Well, here they investigated, you ready for this? Tape discs, which are coin-sized, uh, made of adhesive polyester. They're placed on the lesion and then strip the top layer of the stratum corneum right off. They also tested uh, dental brooches. These are these small needles with barb ends. So far, I'm kind of a little bit worried here. So they compared the performance of ripping a tape disc off a lesion, the gouging it with a dental brooch with those barbed spikes and microscopy samples when tested with PCR, those are the index tests, against the um, skin slit PCR for diagnosis of a variety of these lesions in Ethiopia. Overall positivity rates were highest for that tape disc, 91.5%. The skin slit was 80%, that dental brooch 80.1%, and lowest for just doing standard microscopy. Mm, I had to Google, I Googled dental brooch just to see. What, I've never yeah, it looks heard scary, that right? Before. Yeah, it was more Only if you magnify it. It's expecting. fine until you zoom in, you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, they, they do have like some analysis, like, so what did patients think about the experience, right? We always have those patient experience people. Yeah, yeah people were not huge fans of that not dental brooch and that ripping off of the, the tape disc. So, But all right, um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, we have the article, Subcutaneous Administration of a Monoclonal Antibody to Prevent Malaria. These are the results of a phase two trial in Mali to assess the safety and efficacy of subcutaneous administration of the monoclonal antibody L9LS, the will test, in children six to 10 years of age over a six month malaria season. So, you know, a lot of areas in the world, there's a period when there's malaria and then no malaria, and then there's a seasonal pattern. So this is one of those areas where maybe you give this monoclonal and you get this six month covered. So in part A of the trial, safety was assessed at three dose levels in adults, followed by assessment at two dose levels in children. In part B of the trial, children were randomly assigned in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio um, to get uh, different doses, so 150 milligrams, 300 milligrams, or zero placebo. The primary efficacy endpoint assessed in a time-to-event analysis was the first P. falsip infection, as detected on blood smear, performed at least every two weeks for 24 weeks. A secondary endpoint was the first episode of clinical malaria, as assessed in a time-to-event analysis. Uh, no safety concerns were identified. The efficacy against infection as compared with placebo was 66% with the 150 milligram dose, 70% with the 300 milligram dose. Um, but now efficacy against clinical malaria was 67% with 150 and 77% with the 300 milligram dose. And they give us those good P values, Sarah. <laughs> Sorry, I have something very loud outside the window, so I'll wait a second. <laughs> it's hard. It's because it's there's a corner. And so, yeah. like, it depends on if they're driving past or if they're turning. But you have that corner. nice directional mic, so it, it ends up, I know. And, as I mentioned never... <laughs> before the show, that wonderful, soothing, and easy to listen to it's voice. It's because when I record, I, I think it's because of this time of day, it's like a lot of people. Anyway, okay, I will take us on to our miscellaneous section. I really love usually when there's some sort of like histor med history type paper. So I try to pick those out. And this one was trying to ask and, and think about when did the antimicrobial era begin? Uh, so this was in CID origin of antimicrobial therapy. Uh, it opens with talking about, you know, how even though there's been early healers and herbalist treatments that go way, 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 way back, um, that they don't really count because they were not necessarily used with the intention of destroying a germ. So that's what the author was trying to get at. Um, and so uh, the review walks through various discoveries and methods, but has a focus on Italian physician, oh, I should have looked up how to say, Girolamo Fracastoro, who proposed the idea of restoring health by antagonizing germs way back in the 16th century. Um, his, you know, his recommendations did not necessarily change practices at the time. Um, but I, again, just a really nice, uh, historical perspective. I pulled out one, um, 
section because, you know, part of wrapping it up is saying, well, what happened in between uh, when he talked about it way back in the 16th century and when we really started using antibiotics as we know it today? And I thought this was nice. A lengthy timeline between the genesis of an idea and its delivery is not confined solely to scientific disciplines like aeronautics and space technology. It is also witnessed in the field of clinical infectious diseases. Anyway, so hopefully people will uh, check this one out. Okay, well, let us close out things this week with the article. A measles and rubella vaccine microneedle patch in the Gambia. A phase one, two, double blind, double dummy, randomized, active controlled, age de-escalation trial published in The Lancet, where the authors are looking at micro needle patches, uh, which have been ranked as the highest global priority innovation for overcoming immunization barriers in low income and middle income countries. Um, these are the results of a single center, phase one, two, double blind, double dummy, randomized, active controlled. I just like saying all that, age de-escalation trial conducted in the Gambia. Uh, there were no safety concerns following vaccination in either adults or toddlers. Um, in infants, 93% seroconverted uh, for measles, 100% seroconverted uh, for rubella, while 90% and 100% seroconverted to measles and rubella, respectively, following the MRVSC. So, you know, I don't know if you're Googling these, Sarah Walby, but um, I ended up finding all these kinds of like cosmetic. Apparently, there are these micro needle yes, patches that you yeah. for dark spots. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Enough that I know. Like, yeah, these, these, <laughs> these dark spots under my eyes that came into being during the pandemic maybe one time go away if I, you know, and maybe we start putting a little bit of vaccine in those, right? You know? Yep, yep. <laughs> Excellent. What what a great marrying of my ID brain and my uh, beauty brain. <laughs> but it really, yeah, they, these little patches, they, they don't really hurt. You just yeah. push them on. It just barely goes in. It puts a little bit of the antigen in. Um, and uh, yeah, I, th I think, That's I don't know really if it was cool. Chuck Knurse, but yeah, one of my colleagues has been um, talking with, you know, trying to help really develop, move these forward. Because, you know, we always talk about how important it would be, like even polio, right? Like instead of that mm -hmm. oral polio, wouldn't it be great to do the, the IPV, not paralyze children? Imagine that. Um, yeah. But the idea of like, how do you get all the needles and syringes and everything? If you could just replace that with these patches, just put a patch on and you're good to go. I wonder, do the patches have to be refrigerated? You probably don't know. <laughs> well, but it's I the, wonder same, if no, it's the easier. same issue if the antigen needs to be, you know, refrigerated. But if yeah. you can produce an antigen that doesn't need refrigeration. So, yeah. yeah. Mm. Because that's what you want, right? You don't want something that has to be refrigerated. You yeah, want exactly. To be, maybe one of those, well, just like the beauty ones that I stumbled across. <laughs> I have obviously not used them. Anyone who's watching the video can tell, but um, <laughs> the lack of, or they just don't work either one or the other. But um, yeah, they, they have them in these little packages. You tear it open and then put the patches. That, that's the yeah. hope is that we don't have to deal that's with cold really cool. chain and needles. So yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I guess that brings us to the end of our podcast. As always, the references for this show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. You can find the Infectious Disease Puscast at Apple Podcasts or grab it with your favorite podcatcher or just go to microbe.tv forward slash Puscast. Um, and I guess I should say you go to YouTube. You can see me wear my suit. Um, <laughs> all right. We love to get your questions, comments, and paper suggestions. So just send them to Puscast at microbe.tv. Um, if you like what we do or you just want us to keep doing it, consider supporting the science shows of Microbe TV at microbe.tv forward slash contribute or Parasites Without Borders at parasiteswithoutborders.com and click on the donate buttons. I'm Sarah Dong. You can find me at swindong at Febrile Podcast or at febrilepodcast.com. And I'm Daniel Griffin, and you can find me at Columbia University Irving Medical Center or at parasiteswithoutborders.com, as well as in the other podcasts, This Week in Parasitism and This Week in Virology Clinical Updates. And as always, thank you for this most interesting consultation and allowing us to participate in the care of this most difficult and challenging case. We shall continue to follow along with you Thank you, and dictation, and goodbye. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another podcast is infectious. Bye.